In 1948, most congregations and houses of worship in the United States were segregated by the color of a member's skin. Some were segregated by law, others by custom or by lack of actively trying to welcome and include all people. The first Unitarian Society of Chicago was one of those congregations. Although their church was located in a neighborhood with many African Americans, only whites could join according to the bylaws of the church and according to custom. This might not be surprising to you because it's in, not in the South. Remember that. The day came that many members began to believe they needed to take action against racism if they really wanted to live their values and principles. The minister, Reverend Leslie Pennington, was ready for this day and ready to take action. So was James Luther Adams. James Luther Adams was a renowned liberal theologian and social ethicist, a person who studies religion, beliefs, and values. Dr. Adams taught at the Meadville Lombard Theological School right across the street from the First Unitarian Society of Chicago, and he was a member of the congregation's board of directors, a leader in the congregation. Along with some, some others, Reverend Pennington and James Luther Adams proposed a change in the church's bylaws to just desegregate the church and welcome people, whatever the color of their skin. They wanted to include, not exclude. They saw this as a way to put their love into action. When the congregation's board of directors considered the desegregation proposal, most of them supported it. However, one member of the board objected. Your new program is making desegregation into a creed, he said. You are asking everyone in our church to say they believe desegregating or inviting or even recruiting people of color to attend church here is a good way to tackle racism. What if some members don't believe this? Desegregation was a very controversial topic. In 1948, anything about skin color and racism was controversial. Some people, even though some who supported African Americans in demanding their civil liberties, believed in a separate but equal policy which kept people apart based upon their skin color. Respectful debate ensued at the First Unitarian Society of Chicago. Both sides felt in their hearts that their belief was right. Perhaps they were so busy trying to be heard, they forgot to listen, and so they kept on talking. This is a passage from the Unitarian Universalist Association's Tapestry of Faith curriculum, and it is by, written by Jessica York. This very real story endeavors to tell young people that Unitarian and Universalists in our history had to overcome the cultural attitudes about race in the American context. February is Black History Month. It is a time to remember African American struggles with and contributions to the American experience. But what about African Americans and Unitarian Universalism? The history of our parent denominations, the American Unitarian Association, and the Universalist Church of America, the two bodies that merged in 1961, might seem like a triumph of cultural liberalism. President John Quincy Adams, a Unitarian, worked for freedom within the constraints of his office. Af African American rights were spoken about by Unitarian abolitionists like William Ellery Channing and Theodore Parker. Unitarian Universalist Reverend James Reed and Victor Viola Liozzo, I always get that wrong, I'm sure, were murdered in the Deep South in the 1960s while working for civil rights for African Americans. <laughs> 
Unitarian Universalists continue to act in, to further equality and rights for all people. So Unitarian Universalists have always been at the forefront of liberty for African Americans, haven't they? In reality, the answer is yes and no. Unitarian Universalists have had a history of working for African American rights. For the Unitarians and Universalists of our heritage, though, the two denominations from religious movements, not denominations, religious movements from which we derive our, 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 our place in history, the story is a bit complicated. The Universalists were the bold ones. In 1785, the Universalist General Convention met for the first time, and one of its first actions was passing a resolution calling for the abolition of slavery. Many Unitarian ministers also worked for the abolitionist cause. On the other side, some Unitarians and Universalists were not as affirming of freedom as one might imagine from our current affirmations as a religious movement. Until the past 15 years, one of the districts of the Unitarian Universalist Association was called the Thomas Jefferson District. It was named for the great American who was the architect of the Constitution and President of the United States. Though he did not join a Unitarian church, he once stated in a letter that he would join one if one were located near his home in Monticello, Virginia. <laughs> Despite our pride in his accomplishments, Thomas Jefferson contradicted his lofty ideals by owning the bodies of other human beings. More significantly, and probably more embarrassing, is that John C. Calhoun, Senator from South Carolina and Vice President of the United States, known to history, to American history, as the South's most ardent defender of the institution of slavery, was also a Unitarian. But John C. Calhoun was not passively a Unitarian. He was a firm churchman. He was a founding member of two Unitarian churches that still exist today. Had it not been for Calhoun's efforts, the Civil War or the abolition of slavery might have happened sooner in American history. Then there was Millard Fillmore one of the least remembered American presidents <laughs> and a Unitarian. <laughs> he signed the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 that required all escaped slaves were upon capture to be returned to their masters and officials and citizens of three states had to cooperate in this law. This law permitted slave hunters from southern states to prowl northern cities and to arrest African Americans who could not prove that they were freeborn, and then take them to the Deep South to be sold into slavery. This actually happened. Those was unconstitutional as persons born outside of the South had to prove that they were never slaves in an era when few people carried legal documentation on their persons. It created the horror of citizens being enslaved and deprived of their freedom. Later, President William Howard Taft, a Unitarian, would do little to oppose Jim Crow laws while in office and would uphold them when he served on the United States Supreme Court. Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., a Unitarian, also upheld Jim Crow laws when he was an associate justice of the Supreme Court. Holmes also leads us to something else, another era of Unitarian history that is largely unexplored, eugenics. In 1927, Holmes wrote the majority opinion from the Supreme Court in the Buck versus Bell case that upheld the Virginia Sterilization Act of 1924 demanded that those who were deemed unfit by society 
which should not be permitted to reproduce by having their fallopian tubes tied or by vasectomies. Though the case was not about African Americans, it opened the door to states forcing such procedures on some African Americans and led to legal unethical experimentation on African Americans. Unitarians were vulnerable to the ideas of eugenics. The Unitarian faith welcomed new forms of revolution, revelation through sacred scriptures and through science. Eugenics held that humanity would be improved if those who had inferior traits or genetic defects were not permitted to continue reproducing. Given the prejudices of American society in the early 20th century, the combination of eugenics and race would be truly terrible. Some Unitarians believe that eugenics was a social application of scientific ideas. Their confidence in science was so powerful that science overcame any thought of social mores. In a promoting eugenics, the American Unitarian Association was not reserved. In a paper about Unitarianism and eugenics, Richard Helloway writes about our movement's acceptance of such a racist view. He writes, the most important American public advocate of eugenics was David Starr Jordan, a distinguished scientist and president, the first president of Stanford University. Born into a universalist family in Indiana, his mother gave him the middle name of Starr because she was a great admirer of Thomas Starr King. While he never joined a church, he quickly became a favorite of the Unitarians. The American Unitarian Association published his book, The Blood of the Nations, in 1906. They went through four printings. Races could be defined in rank, according to Starr. Jordan, Anglo-Saxons were, not surprisingly, at the top. Indeed, all the old families of New England and Virginia traced their lines back to nobility and thence to royalty. Almost every Anglo-Saxon has, if he knew it, noble and royal blood in his veins. This is the kind of thing that is going on. Another Unitarian, Lothrop Stoddard, a lifelong Unitarian, contributed to eugenics and vocally supported white supremacy. He published many books on what he saw as the peril of emigration, his most famous being The Rising Tide of Color Against White World Supremacy. It came out in 1920. In this book, he presented a view of the world situation pertaining to race, focusing concern on the coming population explosion among the colored peoples of the world and the way in which white world supremacy was being lessened in the wake of World War I and the collapse of colonialism. During his lifetime, he engaged W.B. Du Bois in debate on white supremacy and its assertion of natural inferiority of colored races. In the United States between 1900 and 1960s, policies based upon eugenics were carried out by governmental bodies and private institutions. The most frequent victims of these policies were African Americans and those with mental illness or disability. At the turn of the 20th century, the Unitarian movement experienced a backlash internally against social change. People, women were discouraged from entering the ministry, even more stridently than in the middle and later part of the 19th century. At the same time, some African Americans in our movement wished to enter the Unitarian ministry and were turned down or discouraged. Samuel Atkins Elliott, the first president of the American Unitarian Association, served in that office from 1900 to 1927. He discouraged women and people of color from entering the ministry during his tenure. And indeed, even into the 1960s, Unitarians and then Unitarian Universalists were hardly welcoming to the efforts of women and people of color to enter our ministry. 
Eliot, Samuel Atkins Eliot came by this naturally. His father was Charles Eliot, president of Harvard University, who was also the president of the New England Eugenics Society. Power merged with racism. Universalists were less powerfully connected than the Unitarians. They were not li as likely to have the financial interests to be connected to slavery. The Universalists did promote education in Virginia after the Civil War for the freed slaves. The denomination funded three schools for African Americans, and they existed into the early half of the 20th century. In the early 20th century, the Christian leader, the Universalist Denominational Magazine, was edited by John von Schreich. He was the minister at the Universalist National Memorial Church in Washington, D.C. From the pages of the Christian leader, Van Schaik condemned interracial marriage and Maria Marian Anderson's performance before the Lincoln Memorial when she was not permitted to sing a scheduled performance because she was African American. Van Schaik relegated stories about the Universalist funded African American schools and other outreach to the back pages of the Christian leader, reducing the amount of coverage until the magazine no longer printed anything about African Americans at all. And he did this without much disagreement from the Universalist denomination. Yes, some clergy protested his outward racism, and Van Schaik did at attack by name African American ministers in print. He was condemning of movements within the Universalist Church of America to work for full racial equality. Without, with all of this, the Universalists were mostly silent. One might think, given the people described so far, that the Unitarians and Universalists were fairly racist. They were probably less racist, on the whole, than the rest of the of white American population were in their time. Yes, some Unitarian Universalists and Universalists who gained powerful positions accepted society's beliefs about African Americans. They probably could not have gained power without acquiescing to cultural norms. Some like John C. Calhoun did terrible things to keep African Americans in bondage. This is our denominational history and it cannot be unwritten nor should it be ignored. Our religious heritage mirrors in some way the history of this nation, even in some of the more terrible facets of American history. James Hawk Baldwin was a great writer and a civil rights activist. He wrote, history does not refer merely or even principally to the past. On the contrary, the great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us, are unconsciously controlled by it in many ways, and history is literally present in all that we do. Baldwin is right. The past is unconsciously with us. Does that mean that given our religious organizations contributed to racist ideas and practices that were not committed to anti-oppression? I don't think so. Indeed, when Unitarians had power in the past, they often reflected or encouraged the prejudices in our larger society, but it doesn't have to be that way. Recently, this congregation affirmed the eighth principle, which affirms working with a, toward a more equitable society. The eighth principle affirms and promotes journeying toward spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. James Baldwin was right. The great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us, are unconsciously controlled by it in many ways, and history is li literally present in all that we do.
we as a society and as a religious institution and as individuals struggle with the ideology of racism and its results. History is still with us. Our journey in this nation, our religious movement, and in the work that we believe before us, is, we have before us, is to discover the history that we carry in our institutions and in our very heads, to challenge it, and to move to a national culture in which our history is acknowledged from many different points of view and cannot control us, even unconsciously. Examining oppression should not be a point of shaming, though. Shaming, guilt, and sin are present in many different aspects of religion to the detriment of those who are taken by those emotionally charged paths. Many of us left other religious traditions because we sought religion that did not turn to guilt and sin. Most Unitarian Universalists do not believe that religious perspectives and practices that encourage shame are the best for the spiritual journey. Talking about history, even our own mistakes, is not a matter of shaming. It's a matter of learning. When this congregation affirmed the eighth principle, it began a, a different path toward dismantling <coughs> systems of oppression. While this path is about social justice, some of this work is also personal work. It means examining the beliefs that we hold unconsciously that have real impact upon the lives of others. It means looking at the unconscious presence of history that we carry inside us. And it also means examining the history of our religious movement with honesty and an open mind and awareness that among our religious ancestors were those who struggled against systems of oppression and often in equal measure, there were those who contributed to systems of, of, of oppression. This is our context. This is who we have been in our religious heritage. Most of us come from another religion or none at all. We have heard about the great social activists in our religious heritage, but the other side of our past has not been visible. We have not known the fullness of our history. We have not known the truth. There's a bit of wisdom from someone by the alias Librarian Shipwreck. That's his now moniker on the internet. He writes, or she writes, studying history will sometimes make you uncomfortable. Studying history will sometimes make you feel deeply upset. Studying history will sometimes make you feel extremely angry. If studying history always makes you feel proud and happy, you probably aren't studying history. <laughs> Black history is the story of Americans of African descent gaining in small increments the dignity of being human. Some of the lessons from the struggle for civil rights are still important for contemporary times. Keep to the larger vision, practice love, what befalls one befalls all. Work to change minds. Never give up. Our past is our present, and many groups of people in this nation are facing new forms of oppression. As a religious movement, Unitarian Universalists will resist those who do not respect the inherent worth and dignity of every person. We will continue to organize. So why is the story about racism in, in Unitarian Universalist history about black history? The history of African Americans is one of overcoming tremendous barriers that European Americans put into place to prevent non-white peoples from achieving and becoming equal participants in American society. Hardly any institution in this country is immune to this, including the Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations. This message today began with an account of the debate at a board meeting at the First Unitarian Church of Chicago in 1948 over racial integration of the congregation. For the minister and James Luther Adams in favor and some on the board's church's board opposed. <laughs> 
The remainder of the story is accounted by Jessica York, who tells us how it was resolved. The debate went on in the board of directors meeting until the early hours of the morning. Everyone was exhausted and frustrated. Finally, James Luther Adams remembered that he should be listening twice as much as talking. He asked the person who had voiced the strongest objection, what do you say is the purpose of this church? Suddenly everyone was listening. Everyone wanted to hear the answer to this crucial question. Probably the person who objected was listening especially hard to his own heart, as well as to the words he had heard from other board members through the long discussion way into the wee hours of the morning. This discussion went on till three o'clock in the morning. The board member who opposed opening the church to people of color finally replied, okay, Jim, the purpose of this church is to get hold of people like me and change them. The purpose of this church is to reflect together and individually upon ideas and beliefs that challenge us to live boldly and to act so democracy might flourish and all God's children are treated with the love and respect that they each deserve. In this, we believe in change in ourselves, our institutions, and our society. Despite the history that we carry, there is still good to be found and hope that when we know the truth, that the truth will make us free. Amen.